Good evening, folks. This is Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, bringing you a grand solar minimum update on Saturday, January 13th, 1141 p.m. Mountain Time, 2018. You're looking at the short half-life cosmic telluric radiation from December 2013 to present. Unique proxy on cosmic rays, cloud nucleation, global cooling, earthquakes, and volcanic activity. You can clearly see that we are going straight up. You can see the spike that caused the 8.0 last year. And you can see the volcanic activity and earthquake uptick that we're experiencing through the new year here and into 2018. Straight up. And that's a heads up. We'll be back with this graph in just a moment. We're going to visit with our friend Al Beto. And there's 100% snow cover above 60 degrees north latitude and soon to be 100% ice cover. <laughs> Nuts and Bay is completely frozen. The Great Lakes are following suit. And we have snow all the way down into Arkansas showing up on the map almost to 30 degrees north latitude. There's also snow in North Africa showing on the map today. And that's a heads up. Thanks, Al. This is reflecting the sun back into space causing the planet to cool. And we're going to get to that at the end of the video when we talk about Venus and one of our favorite scientists, Stephen Hawking. Overnight temperatures plunge, hits the eastern United States. Look at how concerned she is. Now, guys, there have been reports of temperatures dropping 50 degrees in minutes. On Friday, Cleveland residents enjoyed a balmy day with 60 degrees. Just 24 hours later, the temperature was 18. And... Grand solar minimum much, and that's a boom. We're going to be seeing this pattern repeated over and over again in the coming years. Winter storm hunter spre spreads a mess of snow, sleet, and ice across the Midwest, East, and Mid-South. <laughs> that doesn't look like fun at all. Here's the recap. And that's just a little bit of snow and ice. But when you mix them together, oh, you get ice jams and all kinds of other crazy stuff happening. 10 to 16 inches in western New York, 3 to 7 inches in ice, Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, widespread flooding and ice jams. We're going to cover them. Winter Storm Hunter brought snow and ice to much of the Midwest and interior Northeast. Interstates and highways were closed. Much of western New York picked up more than a foot. Warm air led ice jams and flash flooding in parts of coastal Northeast and Hudson River Valley. What, this was a disruptive low, and there's several more right behind it. Winter storm causes dozens of barges to break free and pile up at Emsworth Dam. These are barges stacked up in ice and snow up on the dam head. Engineers examined the damage from barges on Saturday that piled up in the Ohio River as Elmsworth locks and dams after severe winter storms hit the region on Friday. As Pittsburgh slept... Through a fast-moving storm, then smothered western PA with rain, sleet, and snow, a barge broke free from its mooring early Saturday and floated 15 miles past the city limits along the Ohio River and slammed sideways into the Elmsworth locks and dams. Then came another barge, appearing to drift as aimlessly in the heavy winds as a paper boat, despite weighing as much as 1,700 tons or 3.4 million pounds. Then came several more, with ice-crusted waves splashing as one loose barge after another crashed. By lunchtime, at least 27 barge, some spilling over with coal, others covered containers. Ugh, and this is just the beginning of the nightmare. Flood advisories in effect for the Ohio River at Pittsburgh until Monday morning. That's two more days. Flooding prompts evacuations, technical rescues in Kent, Connecticut. The Housatonic River ice flow. <laughs> Look at that. Grand Solar Minimum much? I mean, this is normal for Northern Bath, Maine, but this is Connecticut. And that's a boom. Where were we? Right here. There's the ice flows. Look at that. It looks like we're up in a glacial river up there. This is a spring melt, usually. Not a mid-winter event. 
These anomalous events are going to only increase as we descend into the grand solar minimum. Temperatures did fall fast, and heavy rain and ice jams did cause flooding. This is in New Hampshire. I'll leave you links to all these articles. Thick blanket of hail covers parts of Tasmania for the second day in a row. Destroying cars and tons of other stuff. I mean, this was devastating, loud. And you can hear it rumbling on the doorways of people's houses. This is big hail, up to three inches. You just saw a big chunker hit right there. Let's try to go back to the big one. Watch right here. Boom. Oh, man. That's like a tennis ball. And he's locking the door. Oh, man. So the aftermath of this was not good. There's broken cars, smashed houses, destroyed roofing. Look at the siding. Dents, holes on the house. Everything destroyed. What a summer you're having out there in Tasmania. Must be awesome during this global warming. This is the fourth volcano in 24 hours. Big heads up to the big wobble. Guys, come visit this source. It is awesome. Geophysics on steroids. One of our subscribers is responsible for this. I don't know if I want to share her identity, but she's awesome. This is the fourth volcano in 24 hours spewing ash and showing activity in the Philippine Colossus Mayan volcano. This is a grand solar minimum volcano, which is sitting just south of Pinatubo, a Dalton minimum volcano. We have lots of stats on this. This is coming from FIVOLX, Philippine Volcanics. Best pictures of the eruption. I'll leave you links to it. That was today. Uh, evacuations have taken place. Now, Mayan is most noted for its VEI-4 eruption in 1814 during the Dalton Minimum. This is not the only volcano that has a history of erupting in 1814 during the Dalton Minimum. Cadavar, the one that's just waking up, Legend says that in 1814, it also erupted. And if we're going with the 206-year John Casey cycle, by 2020, these volcanoes will erupt. I think they're going to erupt before then, unfortunately. I think we might looking, be looking at a, a little shorter cycle this time, 204 or 5 years. That's my personal opinion. And I'm seldom wrong. That's the unfortunate fact of science. Now here, Mayan Volcano has been raised to two. It was at one earlier. So the eruption that took place was a moderate, 2,500 meters into the air. Uh, but Cinnabung is also erupting today, and there is seismic activity under Mount Agum. So two days ago, we're going to look at the Agung eruption from the 11th and there's seismic activity today showing up on the seismogram down here this is a 30 minute pulse that's the length of the seismograph here left to right and this is a major seismic event for 30 minutes could be magma shifting in the subsurface residents near Cinnabug are warned to be aware of flowing lava I don't know if we're going to get the coverage there. We have too many tabs open, damn it. Let's go to Worldwide Volcano News. Cinnabung is erupting today with a volcanic erupt ash eruption reported. Also, Mayan Volcano. We just talked about that reawakening. The last time there was a major eruption was VEI-4 in 1814 during the Dalton Minimum. Sabin Kaya also erupting today. There was volcanic ash at Mayan. It was covered in clouds, so it was difficult to get pictures. There was sporadic puff emissions at Sabancaya. Fuego, Chivalouche, Ducono, Reventador, Mayan, and Sabancaya all erupting yesterday as well. The list continues to grow. Now there was a 6.0 in the Solomon Islands today, striking near a Pacific holiday hotspot. And the unique reason this, ha it shook some heads, just like that Hawaii nonsense. The earthquake hit around 100 miles southeast of the Solomon Islands Pacific, and the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center said there is no tsunami. Now, this is interesting because 
The latest tremor comes as the United Nations contingency plan for nearby Indonesia foresees a scenario where 10,000 people would die within 24 hours, with 47 million more affected, according to the emergency response planning documents. Now, the UN-led exercise to prepare for disasters in one of the world's most quake-prone regions is based on a 7.8 quake near the Sanda Strait, close to the capital Jakarta, similar in size to the one that just struck in the Caribbean. And I'll leave you links to that report because we have it. Because this channel is based on science, and if you don't have the data or the facts, you can't make up your own mind. Now, here's the UN Indonesia earthquake plan that foresees 47 million affected and 10,000 dead. Unfortunately, it should be an earthquake and volcano plan because the major threat is an earthquake followed by a volcanic eruption. And this is a little underscoring the death potential. If a major VEI-6 happens, the tsunami will be massive and there will be 100,000 dead, not 10,000. And there will be 47 million affected, the same amount. Because that's the amount of people living in, in the Indonesia region total. Let's do, get a quick seismic update. There are really no quakes of note. I didn't check the space weather, but I imagine that the coronal hole is now coupling with us, which is going to be causing a uh, little geomagnetic activity and a little quieting in the lithospheric flexure area. So that's a, a sigh of relief for those on the San Andreas and other fault-prone areas. Probably won't be any fault uh, major earthquakes for the next few days. Now let's talk about Rattlesnake Ridge. We have um, boots on the ground there taking a videos of this because they're not allowing drones to fly. This is a no-fly zone. This is about to collapse. The red area here is the scarp or the drop down where the major movement is occurring. This is a potential plane of movement here. We'll look at it and then they claim that this is a stable slope. I don't think so. They're telling everyone this is going to be sliding into the quarry. Now, the person I'm talking about has made several videos today just for our channel. And for those in the region that can't really get a good look at this, because there's only one highway that drives by there and it's very difficult to stop or film. So, Easy C Productions, I'm going to link you to her down below. She's local. And she's filming this for us because we requested it. And this is Rattlesnake Ridge in Yakima and Union Gap. And she has several drive-by views, so just come to her site and click on it, subscribe, chat, or whatever you want to do. But you'll get all of the best footage of the Rattlesnake Ridge area that, that exists because it was done specifically for us. Now let's quick talk about it. <clears throat> if you look at the quarry shot that we have, here is the initial wedge, re wedge release, which caused them... Uh, pause to stop activity in the quarry. This is a crushed rock quarry. They're not mining gold or anything here. They're just taking the toe out of this hill to cause a massive landslide and destroy and clog the Yakima River so they can sell crushed stone to local bu building operations. This is a organized crime type facility where if you can get access to land, you can just steal it and sell it for tens of thousands of dollars while you destroy the landscape, the ecosystem, and cause massive failure, which is about to screw with all the people that live here. So this quarry is responsible for this crack. Um, and if they want me to testify, I'd be more than happy to. So that's a heads up. Contact me if you need me. <coughs> now we're looking at uh, a view perpendicular to the side. The quarry's to the right here. And we can see a west face failure surface here, a deformation shearing in this Z here, which means that this slope is not safe. If this big chunk of 400 square kilometers of material starts 400 million or something in that nature starts moving to the right, it's going to cause a massive rotational pressure on this, which is going to cause the west face to fail and slide right into the Yakima River. Now, as this is sliding down into the Yakima River and across Thorpe Road, this entire slide moving right is going to slide down with it. 
this is a lot of weight that's going to push this hill down. So when it moves, it's going to be twofold. It's all going to be moving to the right, and then it's all going to move straight down and clog the river at the same time. I think that the homes that they evacuated across from the quarry are going to be safe, but Thorpe Road will not be. The quarry will be filled, and all that equipment will be destroyed, as it should be, because they're responsible for this slide. That's my official assessment. Please come to the channel here. Easy C Productions, if you want to see awesome drive-bys, couple today she did and one yesterday for our channel, just for us. Give her a big thumbs up like I'm about to do. Boom! <laughs> and she'll love us for what we're doing over here. And we're spreading the truth. Nothing wrong with the truth, is there? That baby's about to slide, and we're going to be documenting it like no other channel has. Real quick, Stephen Hawking suggests deniers of climate change visit Venus for a lesson on greenhouse gases. Well, I suggest Stephen Hawking take his head out of his buttocks and stop living in the fantasy land of mathematics and become a real scientist. Now, if you don't know, a scientist is a person who is studying or who has an expert knowledge in one or more of the natural or physical sciences. I am a scientist because I'm an expert in the physical or natural scientists. I'm an expert field geologist. I'm an expert surficial mapper, geophysicist, geotechnician, geomorphologist, stratigrapher, paleontologist, paleoclimatologist, sedimentologist, I'm all those things because I have expert knowledge in one or more of the natural or physical sciences. Stephen Hawking does not. He lives in a wheelchair and in his mind and in the mind of mathematics. That makes him a mathematician, not a scientist. And now he's a shill for the global warming movement. And that's a heads up. I used to like the guy when I was a kid. You know, I read that book about the universe. And Stephen Hawking has just issued a clear and stark warning to climate change deniers. Amend your beliefs or Earth may end up like Venus. <laughs> He offered to pay the fare for the voyage to Venus to observe just how greenhouse gases can wreak havoc on the planet. Next time you meet a climate change denier, tell them to take a trip to Venus and I'll pay the fare. On the most recent episode of Stephen Hawking's Favorite Places, the theoretical physicist, not scientist, described the startling similarities between Earth and Venus. Now, this guy is so far off base, I don't even know where to begin. I'm going to quickly go through a scientific analysis of some of the reasons why he has no basis in saying this other than he's brainwashed like the rest of the sheep. Bah. Venus is not an example of a greenhouse gas effect. For the first, for one, there is no temperature gradient from the sun and the cold side. The whole planet is basically hot. Now, global warming groups falsely claim that Venus provides an example of what they call the greenhouse gas effect. According to the greenhouse gas theory, the sun heats the surface of a planet and the atmosphere prevents infrared radiation from leaving, which causes heating. Now, Venus's albedo effect is so high that no infrared radiation penetrates through the atmosphere. So based on that known fact, there can be no greenhouse effect on Venus because no solar irradiance gets into the planet's surface. Now, Mercury's surface <coughs> doesn't have an atmosphere that reflects 75% of the incoming solar radi radiation like Venus. Thus, solar radiation can be causing the high temperatures of Venus. The surface of Venus even receives less solar radiation than the Earth's surface. And, it, I, and this goes on and on to just debunk <laughs> why there's no greenhouse effect on Venus. There's something happening on Venus to heat the planet equally everywhere. It's probably volcanic and nasty on that surface. Plus, I believe that Venus was recently ejected from the planet Jupiter, where the red spot was. It's part of the core of the planet that during a time of magnetic perturbation had to be ejected to stabilize the planet in its orbit. And this was seen by people on Earth and documented in our historical mythology. So, 
please check that out. One other thing I want to come over to here is the following from a university lecture about the greenhouse effect on Venus. This is a thermodynamic destruction of the cockamamie idea from this non-scientist. <laughs> now, thermodynamically, Venus is very reflective. In fact, it has a reflectivity or albedo of 0.8. So the planet absorbs 661 times 0 0.2, or 132 watts per meter square of energy. By assuming that the incoming radiation equals the outgoing radiation, which equals an energy balance, we can convert this into an effective radiating temperature by invoking the Stefan Boltzmann law. And we find that T equals 220K. But Venus's surface has a temperature of 730K. Do a little reverse maths. Climate scientists tell us this is right. Raise 730 Kelvin to the power of 4, multiply by 5.67, by 10 to the minus 8, Stefan Boltzmann, and you get a radiative flux of 16,100 watts per square meter. Now, where could that come from? When a university professor tells me that the surface of Venus receives 132 watts per square meter. We just did the math up here, guys. In order for global warming to happen, you would need a radiative flux of 16,100 watts per square meter, which is just a little higher than what's actually occurring. I think this is a fair question. If it's from the greenhouse effect, how did this develop initially at 132 watts per square meter? Because it couldn't do it. I'll tell you how it could do it. It was initially the core of Jupiter, and it was very hot when it was ejected, and it's been cooling since, which is why Venus's um, orbital pattern is circular, because it is a newly captured planetary body in our solar system in a new orbit. It's very young. It's only been there a few thousand years in its current position, and that's a heads up. Whew, I'm winded, and I'm a scientist, and that's a boom. Guys, I hope you got something out of the video. Before we close, we're going to do a little bit of chart walking. I'm going to take you over here to this Shepard, Zarkova, and Zarkov graph, which Adapt 2030 uh, has so nicely made available for our community. And the first time application is occurring currently as the rate of change doubles in the last six months here. Here's the double. Um, and you can obviously see the area we're moving into is four times greater effect. And then by 2020, it's too late to prepare. So you don't have much time. And every day is a day wasted. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance in the oncoming eddy minimum. In the next few years, you're going to experience Centennial and Dalton minimum effects. In the next few years, major volcanic eruptions are going to cause the temperature on the planet to rapidly drop. This information is based on all scientific data available to real scientists that want to go out on a limb and actually tell you that there's a very high probability that the empire you live in is going to cease to exist in a, a few short years. And unfortunately, that's the assessment that many of us has, have made. Few of us are capable of telling the public, though. And that's the unfortunate thing. I have nothing to lose. And that's a boom. Guys, subscribe to our channel if you haven't. Share this with like-minded people. Start preparing for the, uh, the coming cold. Social unrest. Crop failure, price increases. And you can learn to survive and thrive in the coming times. Find a community that you can be around, be near.